wife was, who's not here today, she, she's in Baltimore, was laughing. And after the service, I said, why are you laughing? He said, your mic was on when they were singing the doxology. <laughs> when I was in Bowie's Creek, we were on a rate college radio station every Sunday, and frequently I get a call and somebody would say, John, you are standing too close to the mic today. I make a joyful noise, not joyful music. I wonder how many of you have a, have a special person you go to when you want someone to be praying for you about something? I mean, do you, do you have that certain person because you sort of feel like, well, maybe their pathway to heaven is a little bit more clearer than others? This past week, I was thinking of people back in Ashboro that I would go to. There's Eleanor Yates, lady of deep prayer. She's gathered a group of women that come together to church every week to pray for the church. And I think of Boyd Byerly and Ken Hessler, two men for whom um, for 15 years we had met together on Thursday mornings to share and pray together. One out of a charismatic tradition, one out of a Pentecostal church and a Baptist. And that's a strange mix. But you know what? We serve the same Lord. Who is it you think of being a great person of prayer here in Lillington? Who would you go to? Who is the person you would call? Well, I looked among the people that I've considered in my journey great people of prayer. What was it they had in common that, that, that made me want to go to them? And what I saw was by how they lived their lives, they taught me some very important lessons. Uh, one is prayer is the most important habit of a follower of Christ. Prayer is an investment in the lives of those for whom and with whom we pray. Prayer is daring to ask and trust God boldly, not because of who we, who we are or demanding who, what we do, but because God desires to bless our lives. Well, last week we began a series on living larger with God. And I, I need to share something. As I've walked with you these two months now, I really have a deep sense, that really deep down sense, that God wants to do in and through you and Lillington Baptist Church more than you ever dared to ask or ever dream possible. I really believe this. So last week we began this series of messages on just two verses of Bible. There'd be from the Bible. There are five messages from two little verses in the Old Testament. First Chronicles chapter 9 verses uh, 9 and 10. Pardon? Chapter 4. Chapter four. I didn't say that. Okay. Chapter 4. Um, it, it, it's about a prayer offered by a little unknown guy. The only place he's ever mentioned is in this pastor named Jabez. And last week we did a message entitled, How Much of God Do You Really Want? And I shared three basic principles. First, you will want more of God when you're not satisfied with your life as it is. Let's face it, if we're, not satisfied, if we're satisfied, we don't really seek God. But if you want more of God, you'll want more when you're not satisfied with your life as it is. Second, you will get more of God when you give more of yourself to him. And you will experience more of God when you desire to live beyond your limits. Do you realize most of us never realize what God can and desires and wants to do through us because we live in our little prepackaged box of the known and we're not willing to risk ourselves to the unknown? Well, this morning we're going to focus on the first request in Jabez's prayer. And I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, 
And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him his request. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, I really sense that you want those of us here this morning, and you want the people of Lilligan Baptist Church to live larger with you, that you want to do much more than we've ever dreamed possible or even dared to ask through us. This morning, will you awaken your spirit in each of us so that we can begin learning how to live larger and that we can open ourselves up to you to change our lives, to do things in and through us that will cause us to stand amazed and know that you are doing them and not ourselves. Speak to us, I pray, in the strong name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Now, did you note the first request? Jabez pray. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Now, as I studied this scripture and contemplated and meditated upon it, there are three principles that we can find in this simple statement that can revolutionize our prayer life. It it can change a paradigm of how we pray. And there are three simple points. The first point is this. Dare to ask for God's blessing. Dare to ask for God's blessing. I mean, how many of you here this morning really want God's blessing on your life? How many of you would like for God to bless the socks off you? (laughs) That would be great, wouldn't it? Well, to understand this point, we, we really need to understand something about Jabez's story. We don't know a lot about his background, we surmise from the context or that where it comes in First Chronicles uh, that he lived in southern Israel after the conquest of Canaan during the time of Judges. And he was uh, noted as the head of the clan of Judah. But, but the real story laid behind the meaning of his name. Now listen again what his Bible says. His mother called his name Jabez saying, because I bore him in pain. Well, in the Hebrew, Jabez means he causes or will cause pain. Now, we don't know why a mother would name her child pain. Would you do that? No. But evidently, something happened in the birthing process that the mother chose to to, to just mark it with naming the child Jabez. Now, I, I want you to think briefly about a name. Names identify a person. A name carries great authority. It sets you apart. It triggers memories. Billy Ray, you should have seen him. (laughs) See, if I'd call your name out, Shannon, Shannon made express, it it calls your attention to something. You hear your name, your ears perk up. Years ago, I saw this in front of... Gospel Tabernacle in Dunn, they were having a revival. You know, they had this marquee out there, and they had on it, Come here, Brother Bob, and the Bala was the name Holler. Now think about it, Come here, Brother Bob, Holler. Now, that, that, nobody, that just strikes me as funny. You go here, revivals, Holler. Uh, Joyce was at a t- uh, attending a teacher's workshop years ago, and And uh, they were going over the meaning of names, and there was a a girl was born in a family, and and the mother wanted to give a family name from her side of the family, so they gave the first name, Ima. You know what her last name was? Hog. (laughs) Ima Hog. I think this girl probably grew up with a great self-esteem problem. (laughs) Well, think about Jabez's name. Can you imagine the difficulty of growing up? Here comes the pain. 
or, or you're such a pain. I, I mean, can you imagine a mother giving a son a name to remind her of the pain she had at childbirth? One of the things you need to realize is the importance Hebrews people placed upon naming a child. Uh, the biblical concept of naming a child was rooted in the ancient world understanding uh, that a name expressed essence. To know the name of a person was to know that person's total character and nature. A, a name was one way of expressing the hopes for the child's future. Thus, to name a child Jabez, which means one who causes pain, could really dampen the self-esteem of a child. To be reminded in day in and day out that you cause pain would be an unbelievable burden. Sort of like I'm a hog. But Jabez was not boxed in by his past or his present or his future. He had been taught about God since his birth. He had the story, heard the stories of Israel's deliverance from Egypt and how he led them into the land flowing with milk and honey in Canaan. And by the time he had grown into adulthood, Jabez trusted and fervently hoped in the God of miracles and new beginnings. He came to know this God who had done miraculous things. So why, why not ask God's blessing on his life? And he did. Oh, that indeed you would bless me. He dared to ask for God's blessing. But what was he asking? I mean, we hear the word bless or blessing so frequently from religious and non-religious people, it's sort of lost its meaning. It's sort of like saying, have a nice day. Well, the, the Hebrew word for bless comes from, is the word barak. And it literally means to kneel. It carries the connotation of kneeling in adoration before God as you would a king. Thus seeking God's blessing is submitting your life to him for him to pour out his supernatural power and presence and will in your life. In the Old Testament, God was the source of all blessings. In the covenant relationship, God committed himself to bless his people. But the covenant had to be accepted by faith. And the blessing was found in obedience to a way of life that God had laid down. Jabez, in essence, was asking God to do a God kind of thing in his life. And here's something I think we need to say. Jabez knew pain. And he knew that his only escape was to have God to do something for him that he could not do for himself. He came to know of God's power. His power to change pain into blessing, despair into hope, to remove limiting boundaries to produce a fruitful future. So he asked God to do for him what he could not do for himself, to change a painful past and give him a new God-ordained, God-blessed future. And God can do that. There are people who have had a lot of pain in their life. My guess is many of you have had pain, disappointment, heartache, brokenness at some point of your life. And you didn't know how things were going to go out. And God has changed that in your life and has made it a blessing for you. He has redeemed you. He has saved, saved you. He has given you a, a new life. God can do that. I can tell you all the years of ministry of how many lives I've seen changed because somebody was willing to seek God for what God wanted to do in his life, not what he wanted God to do for him, but completely submitting their lives to Jesus. So Jabez shows us that we can dare to live beyond our limits, that we can, indeed, we're invited to seek God's blessing. Uh, that we invite God to do in our lives what we cannot do for ourselves. We need and dare to pray for God's blessing. But here's the second thing. Trust God entirely to decide what the blessing will be and when, where, and how you will receive the blessing. You know how we use blessing? 
Man, I was really blessed this past year. That means I was healthy, there was no problems, and I had plenty of money. God really blessed me. But that, that, there are other people I know who had bad health problems, struggled financially, and they were just as much committed to God or more committed to God than I was. Just because things are going our way doesn't mean God is blessing us. We can be thankful for what we have. Let, let me see if I can e explain blessing this way. Let me compare two people. One is Princess Diana. On August 31st, 1997, she was tragically killed in an automobile accident. For days, the, the news media gave accounts of her death, her funeral. People all over the world mourned her passing. In, in many ways, she captured the hearts of millions of people. And many would say she was blessed, beautiful. Married into royalty, the world at her footsteps, admired by millions. And her divorce from Prince Charles did not diminish her fame nor her fortune. It's reported she received $27 million divorce settlement. Many would say even in spite of her divorce, she was a blessed person indeed. A few days following her death, an 87-year-old woman died in India. She grew up in Albania, became a nun. In 17 years, she was a principal of a prestigious girls' school in Durling, India. Then one day in the late 1940s, she was in Calcutta, and she witnessed firsthand the plight of hundreds of poor people literally dying on the streets. And she felt God calling her to care for the lowly of the lowest, the poor of the poorest, often lonely and forgotten people of the city. And for more than 40 years, she devoted her ministry to caring for these difficult people. She had taken a vow of poverty, and the serif that she wore cost only one dollar. Her name was Mother Teresa. Two people, two entirely different lifestyles, both respected by millions of people. Most people would probably say Princess Diana was more blessed by what she had compared to Mother Teresa. I mean, the media certainly portrayed that. When Princess Diana died, her story was everywhere, the lead story of all broadcasts. Five days later, when Mother Teresa died, only ABC News led off with a very short story about her death. Only one. That night, NBC devoted seven times more news coverage to Princess Diana and CBS three times more. As one network insider noted, Mother Teresa wasn't even a blimp on the radar screen compared to Diana. But who was more blessed of God? Did you know that Princess Diana suffered with bulimia, a severe food order? Bouts of depression and low self-esteem. Princess Diana was searching for something more than she was experiencing. On the other hand, Mother Teresa had a deep joy and abiding peace in her life. She was fulfilled and content, and as she would say, most blessed of God. You see, to be blessed of God has little to do with what you have, but everything to do with who you are. Jabez saw no reason to dictate to God what God needed to do in his life. He was simply open to what God desired. And with laser-like focus, Jabez focused in on wanting God to do in his life only that which God can do and he knew he could not do. It, it's a kind of radical trust in God. It's interesting, when the book of Prayer, Prayer of Jabez came out, many people interpreted this as to ask God's blessing to give them power and position and possession. But that's not what's meant by this prayer. In fact, it's the opposite. To pray God's blessing in your life like Jabez did is to write a blank check out of your life and ask God to fill it in himself. When you Seek God's blessing like this. 
you're declaring that your ultimate value of your life is what God wants to bring to you and nothing else. Now, do you want God's blessing in your life? Do you really want God's blessing in your life? This, this is what Jesus was talking about when he said in the Sermon on the Mount, Seek first your kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. All our needs become secondary to what we really want. To be wholly immersed in what God is trying to do in us, through us, and around us for his sake. The third principle, if you don't ask, you'll miss the blessing. If you don't ask, you'll miss the blessing. That's why Jabez prayed, oh, that you would bless me indeed. And adding that word indeed is like adding ten exclamation marks. This sort of reminds me of the scene in Genesis 32 where Jacob wrestled with God all night. And as daylight approached, God wanted to leave. And Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. He really wanted God's blessing, and God did bless him. Jabez is saying, Lord, I pray that you bless me, and I want you to bless, bless me a lot. He knew that if, if you don't ask, you surrender the potential. I mean, Jesus basically said the same thing. He said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it shall be open. Now he doesn't say what we'll receive. He does not say what will be open other than he is going to answer our prayer. And we hear these words. And we believe, but we're really scared to let our life loose with God, isn't it? He may ask me to do something I may not want to do. He may change my priorities. He may shift the focus in my life. I like to be comfortable. I like to be warm. I like a nice car. I like dictating my schedule. God's blessing doesn't come your way. It comes his way. Jesus said, Or what man among you, when his son shall ask for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he shall ask for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask of him? God is going to give what is good to us. And sometimes what is good to us is not something we want because we think we know what is good. I wonder why do we continue to live in such spiritual poverty when the abundance of God's blessing is waiting to be poured into our lap. The Father knows how to give good gifts to his children. And the catch is this. If you don't ask, you forfeit those blessings that come to you only when you ask. It's what James said. You have not because you ask not. Paul Harvey told about a three-year-old boy who went to a grocery store with his mother. And before they entered the grocery store, she said to him, Now you're not getting any chocolate chip cookies, so don't even ask. Well, she put the little lad down in the cart, and he sat in the little child seat while she went up and down the aisles. Everything was all right until they came to the cookie aisle. And he stood up from his seat and said, Mom, I may I have some chocolate chip cookies? And she said, I told you not even to ask. You're not going to get any at all. So he sat back down. Everything was going around wild, but she had forgotten something. She had to retrace the aisle, and once again, she went down the cookie aisle. Mom, please, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? She told him, I told you, you couldn't have any. Now sit down and just be quiet. Finally, they were approaching the checkout line, and the little boy sensed, this just may be his last opportunity. So before they got in line, he stood up in his seat and he shouted out in his loudest voice, In the name of Jesus, may I have some chocolate chip cookies? And everybody around did what you did, just laughed, and some even applauded. And according to Paul Harvey, 
Due to the generosity of other shoppers, the little boy and his mother left with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Listen, God may not give you chocolate chip cookies, but he wants to bless you by giving the gift of yourself. Would you dare pray for God to bless you? Let's pray together. Father, I believe the longer I seek after you, I realize that you want to bless us more than we want to be blessed. That you really do want to pour yourself in and through us. And we're not willing to cooperate that you really want to mold and shape us, and that requires some work on ourselves, and that we discipline ourselves in your way, and talking with you, and learning from you, and worshiping you. And we all want it fast food style. We want it given to us on a silver platter. Lord, I know the one thing I know is that you want to pour out your blessings in our lives. You want to pour out yourselves so that you can live in and through us. Lord, may you find us willing this day to open ourselves and dare to ask for your blessing, surrendering ourselves for you to pour in and through our lives only that which you want to give to us because you know how to give good gifts and you know what we need. In all truth, Lord, we need you every hour. Not just when things are tough. Not just when things are rough. Not when there's pain. We need you every hour. In the good times and the bad times. We need you in the good times so that you can shape us and mold us to prepare us for the bad times. So may you find us today declaring our dependence upon you. In Jesus' name we pray.